And now, Lifestyles Unlimited presents the Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Over the next hour, we unfold your map to financial freedom. You'll learn how to retire through investing in single family and multifamily real estate. You'll learn how to create cash flow and build wealth so you can have the time and money to live the lifestyle you want. Welcome to the show. This is Andy Webb with Lifestyles Unlimited. And as always, we're working on your financial freedom. And hey, if you caught the show last week, you know we talked about risk in real estate investing, specifically around investing in single family rental houses and being a passive investor in apartments. If you missed that show, you might want to give that a listen. You can go to lifestylesunlimited.com, click on the radio tab that is archived there. And, and again, we were just looking at sundry risk, which is riskier, you know, what are some things you might think about when it comes to risk. And if you have any questions after that show or really anything else on your mind, you can email me at askandy at l-u-i-n-c dot com. Again, askandy at l-u-inc dot com. So that was real estate risk again, single family and apartments. But I bet I bet you have something else on your mind right now. How about bank risk? <laughs> that, boy, that is the that is the big topic these days. And and I'm sure you've caught the news. The we've had two well, multiple bank collapses already. The second largest and third largest bank collapses in US history just occurred. Of course the largest that was about 15 years ago. That was Washington Mutual Bank back in 2008 as part of the whole global uh, financial crisis. That was followed by hundreds of smaller banks, thrifts, etc., cetera, uh, that failed. But we've just had our second and third largest. There's another one there out there as well. So what, what's going on and what, what is about to happen? What is coming down the pike? And when I think about real estate risk, uh, do I need to be thinking about something there? Now, you, you can spend a lot of time digesting the news, all the stuff that's coming down. It's, it changes daily now. And a lot of time reading and, and speculating about what is about to happen. And, and we're actually going to do a little bit of that today and, and think about what the impact could be on real estate investors. Will, will this lead to calamity for everybody, right, a la the global financial crisis? Or will this lead to that opportunity to invest that we all have been waiting for? Or will this just not really have any impact at all? Right? Maybe, maybe that's the third option. First and foremost, let, let's walk through some of the events and my understanding of these events before we get to what might happen next. You might not be as into the details as I am. And so far, three banks have crashed and burned in the United States. Silvergate actually was the first of those. Didn't mention that one, I don't think yet. And, and that bank catered to the crypto cryptocurrency crowd. Then more recently, uh, on Friday, Sil uh, Friday last week, Silicon Valley Bank uh, went down. That is ac actually the second largest bank collapse in U.S. history. If I if I go back to Washington Mutual, they had about 188 billion in deposits. That's the largest. Well, Silicon Valley Bank had 175 billion. I've heard a couple different numbers out there, but the stats I'm looking at uh, put those deposits when they went down at 175 billion. That's what people had in that bank when it crashed and, and burned. And, and, and that bank catered to startup companies as well as tech, com uh, tech companies primarily. The third one, Signature Bank, that just went down last week as well on Sunday, third largest bank collapse in US history, was concentrated on both uh, tech as well as uh, crypto. And it had deposits to the tune of 89 billion so quite a bit less than silicon valley bank but still the third largest and there's a neat infographic if you go to visualcapitalist.com that shows uh over time over the past i don't know 2001 onward the concentration of banks and how many deposits there's a huge array of banks that went down as we know at following the global uh financial crisis right now these three banks that went down more recently they were they were again in crypto which has been taking a beating since the ftx uh, crash and then startups which startups are inherently loss making companies and we've been seeing waves and waves of tech layoffs on the west coast so clearly there, there there's something going on there and these these three banks were were overly weighted in these areas and Silicon Valley Bank, I think, is, is one to focus on because in, in their case, they just made a bad bet. They made a wrong decision. 
And what they wound up doing earlier, you know, last year or so, a couple of years ago, uh, they put a lot of their their, their depository funds, deposit funds into long-term securities when rates, interest rates were still low, and they got burned essentially uh, as the Fed, the Federal Reserve, started to to raise rates. By the way, that is a whole other question we'll look at. How will these bank collapses affect the Federal Reserve's rate decision next week? Will they continue to raise rates? Will they maybe do nothing? Maybe they will project something new for long-term moves down the road. Will they lower rates? Well, we'll talk about that. After all, I mean, inflation did. It did earlier this week. It did come in lower, 6.4% in January, down to 6.0% uh, last month. Still high, still high for you and me, but lower and, and moving in the right direction. But as, as those interest rates, as the Federal Reserve has taken those up, those securities that uh, Silicon Valley Bank bought, those, those effectively lost value. If you, if you invest in a bond and rates come up, the, the value of that bond uh, declines. And well, their balance sheet suffered. And what they had to do is issue common shares. You have to have certain reserves. You have to have a certain level on your balance sheet. They had to issue common shares and convertible debt um, that can be converted to shares uh, to shore up that balance sheet. And when they did that, that very move led their clients to make a bank run. <laughs> they saw the writing on the wall at that point, and the U.S. Treasury, the Federal Reserve, over the weekend after we learned about uh, Silicon Valley Bank on Friday, and then um, later on on uh, Sunday, Signature Bank went down in New York. They put together a, a backstop program, and basically the issue the banks are having, as I mentioned, is liquidity. If you go to get your, your accounts out and everybody else does, they don't actually have $175 billion in liquidity and available funds for you. So what do we do? How do we allow banks to shore up that liquidity if everybody gets nervous? And actually, the, the backstop itself, it's called the Bank Term Funding Program. It's intended to calm us all. So there is liquidity there. And in fact, what it is, it's a $25 billion program that the Federal Reserve has put together that allows a bank to take a one-year loan from them to get that liquidity. The bank, in turn, has to pledge uh, some of their assets, treasuries, securities, asset-backed loans at par value. That means at face value. The risk I see there to you and I, the taxpayer, is the same thing we saw with Silicon Valley Bank. If the value of those assets goes down, well, who's, who's footing that bill now? But ultimately, this is intended to cover the depositors, right? You, we'll talk a little bit about the FDIC. I think you need to know about that and the level of insurance they provide. Um, because a lot of the, 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 the assets that the Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank had on hand or, or, or represented anyhow, were well above the $250,000 coverage limit that FDIC insures. That's the problem. That's the problem. So this new, this new uh, bank term funding program is intended to cover depositors above that threshold. But, but it does not, it does not inject any funds, uh, any preferred shares, anything like that into the balance sheet uh, for the bank uh, shareholders. So we're not supporting the investors in the bank itself. This is a little bit different than what they did back in 2008, where they did support those banks at the shareholder level to some degree. And it's this last part that has the president and, and his team crowing that this thing we've put together is not a bank bailout. Yes, we're not supporting the shareholders, but man, we are going way above Roku, for example. You may know them. They make TV, streaming, etc. They had half a billion sitting with Silicon Valley Bank. That's a lot of money. Well above the, the threshold, uh, $250,000 that's insured by FDIC. Well, this gives them access to their funds in in essence um but i do view personally i view that as a bank bailout because uh, i don't know what will the cost to you and me what will that be down the line will it flow through in some way in higher banking costs in, in in essentially bank inflation i suspect it will okay so look the feds are making an effort you know um but if you look around things are are still looking pretty shaky now the big question becomes what is that bank risk will more banks fall is there truly still systemic risk? Or, you know, maybe this is even that black swan event that's going to lead to a full system breakdown akin to 2007, 2008, 2009, when hundreds of banks went down. I don't know. 
we'll, we'll watch and see. I can tell you that the next one on the chopping block appears to be First Republic Bank, which is in San Francisco. It's being very closely watched. S&P, uh, the rating side, it has uh, downgra downgraded the bank from A- minus to uh, double B+, plus, right? So they see some risk there. And there's a lot of chatter on social media about the bank failing. And that in itself can become a self-fulfilling pro prophecy. I think that's a downside these days to social media. But that's the chatter out there. And that's in the United States. But it, look, it's not just crypto. And it, it's not just tech sector banks. Europe is getting hammered now as well, middle of the week. Uh, Credit Suisse, or Credit, Credit Suisse, let's say. A uh, longtime Swiss bank founded in the in the mid 1800s. Uh, very solid bank. They did they actually did fairly well during the global financial crisis. They didn't have a lot of the issues a lot of the banks did. However, maybe this I think this is just bad timing. They announced earlier uh, in the week as part of its annual report, a very massive loss for the prior year, huge loss in the billions and quote, this is what they said, quote, material weaknesses in its financial reporting. So things are shaky already out there. What does that mean? <laughs> we misrepresented something on our balance sheet with our P&L. People are still trying to figure that out. And now Credit Suisse, again, when I worked in Germany, when I was overseas in corporate finance, I, I interacted with these bankers quite a bit. We, we dealt with them in placing liquidity on their books. So this is a big bank for, many, for, for every, a lot of companies over there. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Bank contagion right is is the concern and are we are we in that sense witnessing the next black swan event something we weren't expecting i i was a little caught off guard i'll, I'll tell you so just a quick footnote by the way if you are listening and you've got some you know a lot of cash in your bank let's uh talk about the federal deposit insurance corporation the fdic how safe are your funds and what sort of risk management are you practicing if you have a lot of funds? The FDIC, as I mentioned, insures up to $250,000 in deposits from one depositor in any one bank. There may be some nuances there. If you're married, you have separate accounts, et cetera, uh, you'll want to dig into that. But if you're above two hundred fifty k in a single account in a bank, you're at risk. What can you do? Well, spread it around. Spread uh, spread that cash around. Now, there is or was an organization out there called CDARS that stands for Certificate of Deposit Account Registry Service. And this was a, a for-profit company, service company in the United States that essentially, if you came to, the, if you came to them with a million dollars, they would place that across a network of, they had over 3,000 banks and uh, savings and loans groups in their, in their network, and they would basically spread your risk for you. So you had one point of contact to spread your wealth around. CDARS has now been uh, replaced by the IntraFi network. That's IntraFi, IntraFi network. So it might be something to look at if you have a lot of a lot of cash, a lot of cash sitting in one bank, which I would say is now at risk. Yes, we have that backstop. We just heard about that. But, but again, that's a government program. Um, makes me a little bit nervous if if push comes to shove, right? The bank term funding program all right so if you have a lot of capital in one place uh you might want to give that give that some thought i personally at one point in time may have had some concerns but we have been deploying our funds as quickly as we can find the right investment opportunities opportunities for us into multi family so we don't have that concern right now we are pretty much fully deployed so for you maybe your money would be safer invested in hard assets like multifamily or even single family. I still have my houses and I'm still investing in houses. We'll come back to this here in just a little bit. Stick around. Got questions? Call Lifestyles Unlimited at 855-497-4335. The Real Estate Investor Radio Show continues next. Lifestyles Unlimited members share their stories and strategies for success at case study events. If you got laid off tomorrow, what would you do? Would you have to be working at McDonald's or wait to try and find another job with the downsizing in the economy? Kept on coming to meetings, even with David Fisher online and stuff like that, but still just like... We need to make the jump. So we kept praying for time to get 
this job done to, to be able to find the properties how do we find the properties how do you find the time and God answered our prayers and he got downsized from his corporate job but they didn't buy just one house right no they did not you rehab in house number nine right now nine wow so every month the cash flow is thirty two hundred dollars okay the equity of all the houses is up to two hundred and eighty thousand join us this month and learn from people just like you. Check in person and online dates at lukstudy.com. Once again, that's lukstudy.com. Listening to Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show will change your life. Now, here's your host. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Andy Webb. If you have any questions for me, you can send me an email to askandy at L-U-I-N-C dot com. I spent the first half of the program telling you what I can, what I understand and know of the recent events in the banking industry. Um, question is, what's going to come next? I've read some some of the, the brighter minds out there that are long-term hedge fund managers in this industry, in this space. Some think more, more banks will fall. Others say, hey, this backstop that we've got in place, this is going to do the trick. We might have one or two left to see collapse, but I think that's going to be it. I don't know. I don't know the answer. All right. There's some uncertainty there. So I'm going to move on from banking. We'll, we'll circle back here. I want to get to something else, though, where, where, where we asked the question early on. What, what about interest rates? What's next there? What about inflation? Because in the face of all this, this, this action that we're seeing out there with, with bank collapses, the second and third largest, if you missed that statement earlier, the second and third largest in U.S. history, Credit Suisse overseas, big, big bank. What's happening there? What's the Federal Reserve going to do next week? They meet next week to make that next decision. Now, add a little bit of bigger, bigger question marks around this, I think, to, to fuel to the fire. Let's say we just saw that inflation, the report came in on Tuesday, I believe it was, where uh, inflation was set or landed exactly where it was forecast, right at 6%, 6.0 down from 6.4%. So people are going to be saying, hey, yeah, you and I know it's still high, but they're going to be saying, hey, it's, it's, it's going in the right direction. In fact, that may be good news for the Federal Reserve in the light of what's going on. I'm very curious to see what they're going to do. And they're gonna do they're gonna do one of three things. I I'm pretty sure. <laughs> they're going to raise rates anyhow. Now is it gonna be twenty five basis points? Is it gonna be fifty? Because insurance came in a little hotter in January than planned, right? Raise rates anyhow. That might rock the markets in the face of everything else that's going on. We heard that those rate hikes are essentially what cratered Silicon Valley Bank on their balance sheet. So they may raise rates anyhow. They may leave rates flat for now. Let's let the dust settle. That's what a lot of us do. I'm not sure what's happening. <laughs> Let's just take a break, see how things shake out. So they may leave rates flat or they may lower rates in the face of this uh, building bank calamity. I personally doubt they're going to lower rates. They're, they're, they're either going to leave them where they are for now or they're going to take them up, I, I think, a quarter of a basis point. We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, of course, they'll probably also give some more longer term guidance. That's always part of the discourse after their meetings as to future moves as well to possibly help quell the the concerns around the banking industry. But really, does it matter? You know, let me ask you this. Does it matter to you and I, to you and me, right now? You know, we'll get to the real estate side. Final thing, the banks, they invested in the wrong things. They were concentrated or overly concentrated in the wrong places. That, that, that's part of the issue, right? Silicon Valley Bank invested in the wrong long-term, they invested in long-term securities, wrong, wrong thing to do as inflation skyrocketed, or excuse me, interest rates skyrocketed. They, uh, Signature Bank concentrated too heavily in the wrong things as well, crypto and startups, tech. Or in the, 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 the case of Credit Suisse, they're, eh, my, 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 my financial statement, something's off in there, right? Okay, that doesn't exactly help me rest <laughs> at ease with you big big bank so part of the issue there though is what they've been focused on and, and invested in and i ask you the question do you know what you are invested in a lot of us out there and, and i'm not part of that crowd any longer 
are invested in a 401k. And typically that is an array of mutual funds. So how is your 401k, your IRA, what are those concentrated in? Do you know? And, and thinking about Credit Suisse, thinking about reporting, do you even know what sort of fees you're being charged to be participating in those mutual funds? Some of those have very high fees that cost you a lot over the long term. What is the transparency there? Really, the bigger point I'm trying to make is, are you with these, quote, investments, I would call them glorified savings accounts, really, are you in control? Do you feel in control? As the news around Credit Suisse came out, and exchanges across the world cratered, how was your sense of control? Did you feel in control? Do you want to have control? And I'm telling you, you can take control. I just mentioned I don't have 401k funds anymore. I took control. I pulled those out. I put those where I wanted them to be. But here's the thing. A lot of folks out there, this may be you, will be, like I think the Fed will be, waiting to see what happens next. Maybe waiting to see if this is that black swan event that's going to push values down. And this values in this case, of course, I'm thinking home, housing values, apartment values. Or, or they're waiting for interest rates to go down again so I can finally buy and get that low rate because I loved it back when it was 2.5%. Or they're waiting for house prices to drop. What else, what else might be on the horizon, maybe, that you're waiting for? Security, a warm, a warm, fuzzy feeling, perfect information. Well, we know Credit Suisse doesn't have that. Look, th those things are not coming. It, it really, it's, it's a binary sort of question, either or. Either this is the black swan event, the next one, or it's not. Either interest rates go down, that's what you're waiting for, or they don't. Either house prices go down, or they don't. If you're waiting for things to settle or waiting for something to happen, you may be waiting for a very long time. But we've seen the dust never settles. Ukraine, Russia, something comes up. And I want you to just dismiss all of that and focus on the fundamentals. And to get to the fundamentals, I like to go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What do you need? What do I need for my six-year-old son? It's the physiological needs, air, you hear me breathing on the on the other end of the mic it's the water it's the co in my case the coffee i guess i'm drinking and it's shelter among other physiological needs people they absolutely need a place to live so that housing shortage that has been there for a while will continue to be there in fact and i mentioned this last week on the show about uh, risk in in real estate investing um my, my residents have already reached out, some of them, to say, hey, we're, we're ready to renew. Well, my renewal season for, for, for some of them doesn't even start till May or June. I haven't even started to look at the comps to figure out what we're going to do on that side. So they're clamoring to get that renewal done because there is no inventory. And what's out there is, is, is higher price than what they're, what they're looking at right now. I've talked with a number of my investor friends. I was on a Zoom call with some, some fellow uh, rental owners just uh, at the start of the week. They're hearing the same thing. They're hearing the same thing. I think that just some soft evidence for you that points towards that need, that housing shortage. So we as investors in single family houses and in apartments, we fulfill that need that is not going to go away. Cryptocurrency, who knows what the future of that is. I'm not particularly bullish on it. Um, tech, those startup companies, they come and go, right? The markets change dramatically fairly quickly, sometimes fueled by legislature and, and, and the laws that are passed, but housing needs will be there. And those housing products that we provide, those are hard assets. And they're hard assets, and here's the key point for you, that cash flow, right? This is not gold, that's a hard asset. People love gold when there's inflation around because it goes up in value. Guess what? My houses do too. Silver doesn't cash flow until I sell it. It may go up in value during inflation. Guess what? My houses do too. It's not the mutual funds that are essentially stuck in your 401k. Have you ever looked at your choices there? They're so limited. <laughs> you know, some, somebody at your company gets sold a product, a, a, a portfolio of mutual funds that, that you get to choose from. You're extremely limited. 
And once you're invested in them, it is out of your control, not like with my houses. I can sell when I need to. I can do a cash out refinance when I need to. I'll look at the market comps when I go to release or do a renewal. And I can take that rent up as I need to. And I will be able to do that. As I mentioned, the shortage, housing shortage hasn't changed. So I am in control. I'm in control. Now with your mutual funds, to go back to your 401k, when you elect to rebalance your portfolio, the extent of your control is you're, you're going to look backward at the, the past performance, typically, if you even do that. You, you, you might look at the Morningstar rating for that particular mutual fund. May, maybe you consider the fee load, and you should, if that's what you're, if you're, if you're focused on staying in that 401k, look at the fee load. But with our houses and with our apartments, we, we, we know the numbers going in. I want to give you an example here, very concrete. And I went to my inbox, had three emails uh, this morning that I had not yet looked at. All of these are from the Houston area, but get this. Here's one. I know going in, this is a 1968 build. I'm going to be out of pocket to buy this house after the process. We talk about the process on other shows, about $26,000. But I'm creating equity on the back end close to 60 k 58 k I'm tripling my money right there. And it's going to cash flow $350 a month. All right? So we're creating cash flow. We're creating equity. And as I mentioned, that thing will appreciate over time. And my residents are paying down the mortgage. Here's another one. $19,000 out of pocket creates $33,000 in equity. That, what is that? About 150% return, more than double. And it's going to cash flow $224 a month. I love that. I know that's going to be pretty close to reality when I go in, do the renovations, and go out the backside. I've, I've done this so many times. I'm very confident in the numbers. I, I bought a lot of houses from the realty team at Lifestyles Unlimited. Here's another one. 26 k out of pocket. Equity capture, 52 k that is, that is exactly tripling my money. So at the end of the day, what that means is I'll have $78,000 in equity in that house. If I need to sell, I've got buffer. I've got risk protection, unlike, <laughs> you know, these banks, uh, FDIC and backstop, et cetera. So I know going in, Roughly cash flow, in this case, $217, what my expected cash flow is. And my, my realty team here, they're, they're typically a little conservative. Historically, I've come in higher than, than what they tell me, and I'm okay with that. You know, I'm okay with that. Um, so, but I know the point is, you go into your 401k, who knows which direction it's going to go. You, you buy that crypto, you hope it goes up. It's been all over the place. It's caused some banking issues now. You invest in those tech startups. Ah, you have a lot of potential there. I will give you that. You have a lot of potential to go up. If it's a winner, there are a lot of losers. And now we're seeing that some of these banks that are concentrated in those areas are effectively losers as well. So these emails that I'm looking at with you, I just looked at three, the most recent I got. Why are they so powerful? Because I see what's coming down the pike for me if I buy this asset. And I take control. We make money five ways with our houses. I mentioned the cash flow. I mentioned the equity capture. I mentioned appreciation. My resident is paying down the mortgage, and there are tax advantages there. And it does not matter to go back to the potential black swan event, the potential for a drop in interest rates, the potential for inflation to go down or up, or whatever else you think might be coming. I don't care about any of that because we make our own economies. We buy right. We've already seen at a discount. I'm able to triple my money on one of these houses so we make our own economies it doesn't matter if a black swan event comes along and creates more opportunity to where instead of tripling my money in this house i'm able to quadruple it great that's great i'll take it but i'm not going to sit on the sidelines and wait because you just don't know what's coming i see great opportunities in houses as we just saw i see great opportunities in apartments we just got into two investments in apartments this year we'll keep going by the way be sure to tune in next week i have an interview with a couple from utah so i mentioned the Sun Belt. i don't know if utah factors into the Sun Belt, but we've got a couple actually several syndicators in utah that are syndicating apartment investments there so like I said earlier, the bank risk is there right now. If you have a lot of capital, apartments are a great way to go. Skip the houses, go straight to apartments. So what's the impact going to be to us? That's the question. Will there be added buying opportunities? Maybe. 
Will the market thin a bit as investors clam up much like they did in the early days of COVID? Maybe. Will this be a much bigger black swan event than they want us to think? Self-fulfilling prophecy? I don't know. Will there be complications? Financing might get a little bit tighter, but when you're educated and you know what you're doing, you've learned the basics, you've learned the fundamentals, you're ready to go. You've built your team, you've got your network. You're going to find a winning combination out there. Go to lifestylesunlimited.com, learn about our free workshop, and I thank you for listening. You have a great day. The information and opinions you hear on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented constitutes an endorsement recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.